goodness and severity of God, Judges chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Well, the title of the sermon is a reference to the same phrase from Paul that we find in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, where Paul says, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. The goodness and severity of God. Words also mean kindness and sternness, right? The kindness and sternness of God. God is good, God is kind to those in Christ, despite how undeserving we are. We know that we are manifestly undeserving of the goodness and the kindness of God. And God, at the same time, is absolutely unyielding, unwavering, uncompromising toward sin and toward unbelief. An absolutely terrifying severity awaits those who die in their sin. And an abundant, a blessed, immeasurable goodness awaits those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If, Paul says, you continue in his goodness. Now, Paul is referring in Romans chapter 11 to the children of Israel who are cut off from God in unbelief. And toward them and throughout the book of Judges, we see over and over and over again both the goodness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who fell into idolatry, toward those who forgot the Lord their God, went and served the gods of the nations all around them. We see God's retributive justice in delivering them over into the hands of their enemies to scourge and to chasten them for their idolatry, and how God himself puts them under severe judgments for abandoning the covenant. And at the same time, in the book of Judges, we're also reminded time and time again of the goodness of God, aren't we? Despite the fact that Israel is a stubborn and stiff-necked people, God remembers his covenant goodness. He remembers his faithfulness, his word to their fathers. He continues to look on them in their misery with compassion. We see that over and over again. He looks on them with mercy. He hears their cry. He remembers the covenant that he made with them. And over and over and over and over and over and over again, God delivers his wayward people. We're reminded of what Peter says, that the, the patience of our Lord is salvation. We're to see his long suffering, his patience as salvation. That goodness all the more magnified against the continuous, persistent backdrop of Israel's sin and rebellion. It's stunning. The contrast between the two is absolutely stunning in the book of Judges. The professing church today loves to exalt the goodness of God. They love to preach the goodness of God, think about the goodness of God, extol the goodness of God. But they do so at the expense of exalting the severity of God at the same time, which is also good. Paul warns us here to consider both. Consider both the goodness and the severity of God. It's also true today in the modern church that the, the definition of God's goodness that they choose to exalt is not a biblical definition. We'll see that some as we look at the text tonight. The goodness that they imagine from God is not the same character or the same quality of God's goodness that we find revealed to us in the Bible. And they presume to worship God through a false or unbiblical understanding of his goodness. We'll consider that as well as we work through the text. We want to consider our text this evening, Judges chapter 10, verses 1 through 16, under three headings. One, God's goodness, verses 1 through 5. Two, God's severity, verses 6 through 14. And then third, the character of God's goodness in verses 15 and 16. God's goodness, God's severity, and then the character of his goodness. Let's begin with God good, God's goodness, verses 1 through 5. And verse 1, verse 1 begins with the words, after Abimelech. Now, if you've been following along with us as we've been working through the, the book of Judges, those words in and of themselves are gracious and good words from God. 
after Abimelech shows or expresses the goodness of God to his own people. The wicked tyrant, derelict, usurper, bramble king Abimelech has been put down. And praise God, God knows how to put down the wicked, right? He knows how to put down those who oppress his, uh, his people. All of that by the determined purpose and for knowledge of God. He sets the wicked, he sets their feet in slippery places, the psalmist says. They are brought to desolation in a moment utterly consumed with terrors. We may see occasionally or think the wicked prosper, but God knows how to put down the wicked. He knows how to take care of his own. The words after Abimelech are good words. They're gracious words. They truly express the goodness of God. Now, when the Lord continues to pour out his goodness, look at verse one. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in the mountains of Ephraim. Now think about with me, Abimelech was the son of Gideon, son of Gideon by a Shechemite concubine, the son of Gideon by a Canaanite, right? So Abimelech wasn't a full Israelite himself. He would have been viewed that way. Here we have in verse 1 now, coming after Abimelech, Tola, son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, why would our author here take time to belabor the genealogy, if you will, of Tola, it's because Tola, by contrast to Abimelech, was a true Israelite. He's an Israelite indeed. And that's why our author labors to give the lineage here. He was a true Israelite, raised up out of the tribe of, tribes of Israel to save or to deliver Israel. He was a man of Issachar. To save Israel from what? Well, no details are given here. In other accounts, the Lord has delivered Israel into the hands of this enemy or that enemy. No details are given to us in this account. We just know that he arose to save Israel. He was brought up by the hand of God to save them. Save them from what? We don't know. But ultimately, Tola was raised to save Israel from the judgment of God. <laughs> Tola, as the other judges, raised to save Israel from the severity of God. Now think with me, that's true of us today in our own salvation. Ultimately, Tola was to save Israel from the wrath of Almighty God due their sin. To save Israel from the severity of God. No enemies here are mentioned. No exploits are mentioned. Only in verse 2 that he judged Israel 23 years and he died, and he was buried in Shamir. Now, ordinarily, thinking of these judges rising and the judges falling, ordinarily we used to be, we'd be used to hearing, after he judged Israel 23 years and then he died, we'd be used to hearing, and then the children of Israel again did evil in the eyes of the Lord, again played the harlot with the Baals. That's what we'd be, we'd be accustomed to hearing. So then God would deliver them into the hands of their enemy, into the hands of some pagan people, some Canaanite group. But it's interesting in verse 2, that's not what we have here. It may be that that's exactly what happens. We're not given the details, but the text seems to indicate that one period of peace under Tola is then succeeded by another period of peace. It seems that one period of peace under the rule of a judge is simply followed by another period of peace. Look at verse 3. This is a display of God's goodness. This is a display of God's goodness toward an undeserving people. After him, verse 3, arose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Notice in verse 3, it doesn't say that Jair saved Israel. It's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't say that he saved Israel. It says here that he judged Israel. It looks to be that Jair immediately follows Tola. There's nothing to save Israel from. It's just a period of peace. God has raised up a judge, Jair, to follow on the heels of Tola. This is the goodness of God, isn't it? The goodness of God. He judged Israel. Jair judged Israel 22 years. So between Jair and Tola, 45 years of peace in Israel. And again, the goodness of God. 45 years falls short doesn't if we remember the jubilee from Leviticus 25 falls just short of that 50 years of completion where the trumpets would be blown and the captives would be set free and the debts would be forgiven they come just shy of a jubilee year uh, 45 years is a long time not quite long enough 
right? Not quite long enough. It's not exactly what we're looking for. What we're waiting for is for God to usher in an everlasting peace, right? They were made that promise. They were looking forward to that promise, but that's not exactly what they get. God will fulfill that promise. God will bring in everlasting peace through the everlasting reign and the everlasting kingdom of the everlasting Prince of Peace. This is just a taste here, verses 2. Just a taste, verse 3. A mere shadow. Like all shadows, it doesn't quite live up to the reality. Tola, verse 2. Jair, verse 3. Now, what about Jair, verse 4? He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. They also had 30 towns, which are called Havat Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. The fact that Jair was a Gileadite and judged Israel from Gilead is important because in the distress that follows, if you remember the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines also, uh, the, the distress that follows all due to Israel's sin, Gilead is going to be in the crosshairs of God's judgment by the hand of Ammon. It would lead, or it would be Gilead who would be called upon, uh, who would call upon Jephthah to deliver them from Ammon. And then we have Samson who would deliver Israel from the Philistines. Now, however long the peace lasted, 45 total years, it will always be temporary. And that's one of the lessons of Judges. However long the peace lasts, the peace will be temporary and the peace will be tainted. As good as it must have been, 45 years, Jair is just a man. Tola, just a man. And they are sinful men. Look at Jair. 30 sons, not including daughters. So what does that tell you? It tells you many wives. Many wives. There's some in our church that are trying to catch up. They're not going to make it. <laughs> They're not going to make it. <laughs> 30 sons, not counting daughters, that means multiple wives. Jair multiplied wives to himself, just like who? Just like Gideon. Remember Gideon. The Lord has specifically said, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, that kings, rulers in Israel, were not to multiply wives to themselves. Why was that law, that good, just, holy law given? Well, it's the main reason was that so the leader in multiplying wives to himself, would not be turned away from the Lord. His heart would be turned away, essentially by his wives, away from the Lord. And we see that happen multiple times in Scripture, God's Word always proving to be true. His 30 sons, Jair's 30 sons, rode on 30 donkeys. That's the way that kings and princes got around in those days. So what do we see? Those 30 sons riding around on 30 donkeys were over 30 cities. In other words, they were living like kings. Another comparison with Gideon. Can't help but draw similarities between them and the downfall of Gideon. Gideon refused an offer to be king, but they ended up living like a king. Multiplying wives, multiplying wealth, multiplying sons. And Gideon's heart was drawn away from God. And here we don't have all the details with respect to Jair, but we see Jair doing relatively the same thing. There's a substantial peace in Israel, that peace indicative of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, undeserved, but it's foreshadowed, you could say. You can see it there in the white spaces between the lines. That peace is not destined to last. It simply cannot last. Why? Because these are fallible men. We need an everlasting king. We need the prince of peace. We need a savior. Those periods of peace given by the Lord would offer hope to Israel of the Messiah. Unless we think that hope was strictly restricted to the Old Testament, they certainly hoped in the Messiah. With every passing period of judgment, right? Every time they fall back into their sin, God delivers them into the hands of their enemies. They're oppressed. They're under severe distress. They're in despair. And they cry out to God with every repetition of that pattern. Certainly, there were those among the children of Israel who pleaded with God for a full and final deliverance, right? Pleaded with God to be delivered from their oppressors. Pleaded with God to be saved from their sin. 
pleaded with God for the coming of his Messiah. It was overwhelmingly obvious to them that, this, that lasting peace wouldn't be possible through any human deliverer. And so what inevitably happens? Well, what happens is exactly what we have grown to expect would happen. Verse 6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. How many times have we heard that refrain already in the book of Judges? They again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But notice, they're stacking up idolatry now. Served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Uh, that's a little addendum to the end, as if we couldn't have figured that out. <laughs> uh, that's an understatement, right? Forsaking the Lord, did not serve him. They absolutely abandoned the goodness of God to them, and the people resort to idolatry. We're reminded that in their natural condition, the fallen heart of man, his goodness to them, which is abundant, his mercy is abundant, that goodness not compelling enough to compel them to any perseverance for him, to any faithfulness, any steadfastness, any basic gratitude, didn't even express just basic gratitude to the Lord for all that the Lord has done. We've got to remember to thank the Lord, right? Continuously, gratitude on our lips, on our heart, for all that the Lord has blessed us with. They forgot him, forsook the Lord, did not serve him. As soon as Jair dies, they pursue their sin, and not just pursue their sin, they pursue with reckless abandon, flat out, full speed sprint away from God. Right? The restraints come off at the death of the judge. They see it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. The husband goes out of town for a week, and hey, I can do what I want. Right? The parents leave the house for the night. I can do what I want. Time to party. Time to relax. I'm tired of the restraints. I'm tired of the accountability. I'm going to do what I want. And what you want is a brazen, high-handed, self-indulgent wickedness. It's like the prison conversion testimonies, right? We've seen those. In prison, they're model servants of God. They write flowing, eloquent letters filled of, with praise and gratefulness to God for all that he's done for them. But as soon as they're let out, start running with the same crowd, running in the same course of debauchery they ran in before. It was nothing more than a jailhouse confession. Notice it's not just the Baals this time in verse 6. Israel is glutting herself on pagan gods. You notice it's getting worse, don't you? As we're working through the book, their spiritual decline is accelerating. Their spiritual decline is going lower and lower and lower and lower. It's like a caged animal, that as soon as the bars come off the cage, as soon as the, the door is unlocked, they are wild, wanton into their sin, pursuing their rebellion, wallowing in sin with abandon. Baal, the asterisk, the gods of Syria, gods of Sidon, gods of Moab, gods of Ammon and the Philistines, anything but the God of the Bible. How degenerate is the human heart. We need a renovation of our nature. That's what the human heart needs. That's the response of the human heart to the righteousness, the holiness, the goodness of God. We rebel against him. Just consider for a moment how good God has been, and yet in our flesh, we're so prone to wander. Those are Christians that are prone to wander. The lost just run headlong into their sin and give an opportunity. We need a spirit within us. 45 years of the continued goodness of God followed in response by unbridled wickedness. So in verse 6, what's going on here? What's going on in verse 6? The bride, remember this is the covenant people of God. The bride has once again come out of her dressing room to play the whore with other lovers. 
That's how we see the Lord describing wayward Israel in Ezekiel 16, isn't it? Here she multiplies her acts of harlotry. This is the way the Lord describes them in Ezekiel 16. Provoking the Lord to anger. She multiplies her acts of harlotry. And this is the continuing theme of the book. We see the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and the persistent, increasing, downward spiraling sin of the people. And so what does the bridegroom do? What does the bridegroom do? The bridegroom is good. The bridegroom delivers her over to suffer the horrific consequences of her harlotry. If Israel will not remember God for his goodness, then Israel will be brought to remembrance through his severity. Do you see? If Israel will not remember the Lord for his goodness, Israel will be brought to remember the Lord through his severity. Verse 7, So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. The language of verse 7 figuratively refers to a blast of hot air from the nostrils of God. It's literally, that word anger is referring to the nostrils of God. Lord's nostrils. Now, for those considering here the incommunicable attributes of God in our study with our church, this is both, think with me of how this is the case, this is both anthropomorphic and anthropopathic, right? It's both anthropomorphic and anthropopathic. What we see in verse 7 is the unchanging, settled, it's not sudden, it's not arbitrary. It's not short-fused or trigger-happy. It's not the way God is. What we see in verse 7 is the unchanging, immutable, settled, determined, divine disposition toward sin, particularly the sin of idolatry. That settled divine disposition is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. And this is the severity of God toward their sin. In other words, this isn't a light matter. No light matter. God is not merely disappointed. He's not merely grieved or merely offended. This is undiluted, Perfect, full, righteous anger toward wickedness. And God's wrath is a perfect wrath. It's a severity that you and I, it's exactly what you and I would expect to see considering God's goodness, isn't it? If God is good, then God must be just. If God is good, he must be just. Make a rhyme out of that. <laughs> a God who isn't just isn't good. If he's not just, he's not good. And if God is just, then he will punish sin. God's wrath then is an expression. It's a righteous response of his holiness to all that is unholy. And that is forever true of God in a perfect, absolute measure. That's why... Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, you're under the righteous wrath of Almighty God. And wrath is an expression, it's a response of His holiness to unholiness. In verse 8, from that year, Philistines, the people of Ammon, harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the, in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. That word there, harassed and oppressed, it's two words that sound very much alike. It's a word play. It means shattered and battered. It's a good way to think about the word play. Shattered and battered. They are decimated. Decimated and broken down. They were destroyed. That word for shattered means destroyed and broken, oppressed, harassed and oppressed. Sometimes in reading through the Bible, right, we can sometimes um, lose a sense of the reality of the, what the words are saying, 
what is meant. And because we're, we've not experienced those kinds of things ourselves, we can sometimes uh, overlook the, the dire circumstances that they were in. Imagine Israel being invaded. Imagine our country being invaded. And we've got nothing. We have no one. We're handed over into the hands of our enemies who are decimating us, shattering us, breaking us, oppressing us, right? This, these are devastating circumstances. Verse 9, moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin, against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. They were invaded, killed, afflicted, 18 years. This is the severity of God. The severity of God. Severity of God had caused severe distress. Ammon is the instrument of God's righteous retribution. Ammon, the Philistines, are the agency of God's severity. And Ammon is entirely responsible for their own sin in this. Interesting, isn't it? Entirely responsible for all the evil that they do. This is the doctrine of divine concurrence that we've talked about. God, who is sovereign over all, uses Ammon as an agent of his justice, even though Ammon herself is unjust. This is the Lord's righteous retribution against his rebellious people. In Ezekiel chapter 16, thinking about how that text correlates here, God gives us an example, an illustration, of the bridegroom's response to the harlotry of his bride. The Lord says in Ezekiel 16, I stretched out my hand against you, listen, diminished your allotment and gave you up to the will of those who hate you. Now remember, this is the Lord exacting judgment, pouring out his wrath upon a wayward harlot bride in the Old Testament here, Old Testament Israel. Diminished your allotment. I gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. That's true of every sinner. Simply will not have enough of your sin. And you think to yourself, well, as I get older... <laughs> I'll sin less. No. Just sin takes different shape, different forms. Your heart not satisfied. Filled to the glut with your sin and still not satisfied. Verse 29, Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea. And even then, you were not satisfied. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God. It's almost a statement of astonishment. The Lord knows all things. The Lord knows how degenerate the heart of man is. And he brings this up to them for them to consider. How degenerate is your heart, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. So, verse 40, he says, They shall also bring up an assembly against you. They shall stone you with stones, thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire, execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. And I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury toward you. The Lord says, I'll recompense your deeds on your own head. It's terrifying, isn't it? Absolutely terrifying. How do the people respond? Verse 10. The children of Israel cried out. Remember, 18 years has lapsed. It took 18 years. The children of Israel, we are in our fallen condition, so stiff-necked, aren't we? To my shame, so often, just hard-headed, hard-hearted, rebellious, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. All right? Well, this looks like it's got potential. <laughs> what does the bride do? Well, the bride does exactly what we've come to expect. 
that the bride would do. She cries out for deliverance. 18 years under the Lord's judgment, pain, death, misery, woe, severe distress. 18 years considering the severity of God for her sin. She cries out to the Lord for deliverance. This is the same old song and dance. Second verse, same as the first. The Lord desires the repentance of the nation. Isn't that what this is, verse 10? We've sinned against you. She's confessing her sin here before the Lord. We have to remind ourselves that confession of sin isn't repentance. She's confessing her sin. Some present the gospel, and you know this, as simply admit, believe, and confess. Now, that's the presentation of the gospel. Our response to the gospel should be nothing more than just to admit, believe, and confess. It's as easy as A, B, C. Just admit, believe, and confess. Admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ, and confess your sin. What's the problem with that picture? Is it, it isn't enough. It isn't enough to admit your sin. It isn't enough to confess your sin. You must turn away from your sin. You must repent. We've noted the Lord's righteous retribution. Notice his righteous rejection in verse 11. Righteous rejection. Verse 11, so the Lord said to the children of Israel then, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? Haven't we been through all this before? How many times are we going to go through this, Israel? How many times? Verse 12, also the Sidonians, the Amalekites, the Maonites oppressed you. You cried out to me and I delivered you from their hand. And right back where we started, you are right back in the same spot, right back in the position you were in before I delivered you. Even worse, where is your love? Where's your devotion to me? Where's your heart? And that's the point. Verse 13, yet for all that, for all those times I delivered you, you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, God says, I'll deliver you no more. Now that again, the severity of God, isn't it? God threatens here to deliver them up, to hand them over. I will deliver you no more. We've been through this before. We're not going to go through it again. This is the same old song and dance. Go cry out to the gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. It's time for Israel to learn a hard lesson. Israel, you know, you can imagine. Uh, maybe a, a brief moment of panic sweeps over them. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, all I have to do is acknowledge my sin, isn't it? We've confessed our sin. What more would you have us do? Uh, I am supposed to ask for forgiveness, and as long as I ask for forgiveness, God is supposed to forgive me, and that's how this whole thing works. Nope, you've been spending too much time in Satan's Sunday school class. <laughs> Somebody sold you a bill of goods. Somebody's told you a deceitful lie. You've forgotten. Maybe you've never known that God is just, <laughs> and God is righteousness, and God demands holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. God will not be manipulated by your crocodile tears. God will not be manipulated by your hypocritical face. What a man sows, that will he also reap. Mere recognition is not real repentance. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 but whoever confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. Well, the whoring bride has done this over and over and over again, demonstrating in that that she's unwilling to change. Unwilling to change. She's miserable under the conviction, under the misery and distress of her sin. And so she comes crawling back to the bridegroom for peace, for protection, for deliverance, and for salvation. But seemingly, as soon as she gets what she wants from him, she pines after other lovers, slips back into the attire of her harlotry, and offers herself up to every godless jack that passes her by. That's the way that she's acting, right? It's an enslaving pattern, an enslaving pattern. It's no different for many today. Many 
who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. They profess to know the Lord, and yet they seek refuge from responsibility or accountability, from serving him. They seek refuge in their games. They seek refuge in pornography. They seek refuge in their leisure, in their pleasure, in money, the ease that God has given them. They abuse all the goodness of God on their own lusts. And God says, cry out to the gods that you've raised up for yourself, that you've chosen for yourself. I'll not deliver you. It's terrifying. It's terrifying considering that we as Christians, right, when we go back to the Lord over and over and over again for the same sin. Am I the only one who's experienced that in their Christian life? We go back to the Lord to ask forgiveness again. Go to the Lord, ask for forgiveness again. Our Lord is a consuming fire. He who sins willfully after receiving knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. There's simply remaining a certain terrifying awaiting judgment at the hands of God. It's terrifying. But we have to understand the difference between the child of God who knows God as father and the brazen adulterer who prostitutes himself out in rejection of the Lord, right? The brazen harlot loves the deliverance of God, the promise of peace, the promise of hope, the good feeling that comes with forgiveness and with all that religious, those religious trappings, right? Loves what the bridegroom can do for her, loves the benefits of the bridegroom, wants to be in heaven. Why wouldn't we want to be in heaven? Why wouldn't we want to avoid hell? But the brazen harlot loves not the bridegroom. You see the difference between the two, right? It's a different relationship. She goes back to the trough time and time and time again. But in doing so, with no love for the bridegroom, not a changed heart, not a changed mind, not a sorrow over sin, not a deep hunger and a thirst for righteousness, not a deep longing to be holy as he is holy, not a deep longing in their heart to be devoted in love to the bridegroom for all he's done for us. She goes back to the trough time and time again, treating the blood by which she presumes that she is sanctified a common thing. It's an insult to the spirit of grace, the Bible says. She wants the benefits of the bridegroom. She doesn't want the bridegroom. Eventually, the Lord says to that brazen harlot, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. I'll deliver you no longer. Right? That day comes for every brazen harlot. Every one of them will eventually hear those words, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. Now get away from me. I don't know you. You worker of iniquity. If we sin willfully, after we have received a knowledge of the truth, it no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. We need a heart change. Israel needs a heart change. They need an inward transformation. They need a love and a devotion to the bridegroom have their own sinful will, their own sinful inclinations, their sinful indulgences, their sinful depravity put down. To have their heart changed, right? To see the bridegroom as precious. To see the bridegroom as the treasure that he is so that they, beneficiaries of his goodness, beneficiaries of his deliverance, beneficiaries of all his blessings, love him above all. Love Him as, super, as supreme. When we have Him as our bridegroom, uh, and that way, in that relationship, God is our heavenly Father who chastens us as sons. And really, what good father doesn't chasten, chasten the sons whom he loves, the daughters whom he loves? 
Well, Israel is concerned about the state that she's in. So in verse 15, children of Israel said to the Lord, we've sinned, we've sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. Really, what kind of, what kind of prayer is that? Um, do whatever seems best to you, but not that. <laughs> Don't do whatever seems best to you. Deliver us. And then do whatever seems best to you. And don't wait. Do it today. We pray. So then verse 16, they put away the foreign gods from among them. And they served the Lord. His soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. We've considered the goodness and the severity of God. But notice with respect to verses 15 and 16, notice the character of his goodness. His soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Think with me. Most would say, we might even be tempted to think, that God was moved to compassion because of their repentance. This looks like genuine repentance. God was moved to compassion because they cried out to Him. And listen, they really meant it. They really meant it because they put away those foreign gods and they served Him. They really meant it this time. They're really sorrowful. They're really sorry. And because of their repentance, God wanted their repentance after all, they got serious. The Lord saw that they were sincere. That's a catchphrase today, isn't it? They really meant it. They really meant it. They reached the repentance benchmark. They reached some imaginary line where their earnestness gets to a level that now God can't help but to do what they're asking him to do. They reached the repentance benchmark. His heart was softened. They earned it. They earned it. Do you really think that that you can manipulate God in that way? No. God is not manipulated by that. Notice here the Lord's compassion, his goodness, isn't tied to what Israel is saying or doing. What exactly is his compassion or his goodness tied to? The Lord is moved to compassion by what? By her misery. (laughs) Israel, Israel is the apple of his eye. And here just deplorably sinful, but remains the apple of his eye. Deplorably wicked, but this is the covenant people of God. His covenant people. Repentance is commanded. So let's make make no mistake about that. God's overlooked these times of ignorance, now commands every man everywhere to repent. Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, a true repentance is produced by godly sorrow or Godward sorrow over sin. Not worldly misery over how bad our circumstances are, how many times I've been jilted by the whoremongering men that I'm following after, right? How unhappy we are, but Godward sorrow over sin for how undeserving we are for having offended God. And that godly sorrow, that Godward sorrow, produces repentance leading to salvation. The worldly sorrow of the brazen harlot only leads to death. The brazen harlot is only capable of worldly sorrow. She doesn't care about the bridegroom. But although repentance is a condition of saving faith, and it is, if faith is saving, it will be a repentant faith. But it is not the material cause of favor with God. You don't earn favor with God through your repentance. You don't earn the kindness of God through your repentance. You don't earn the compassion of God through your repentance. This is something that is good for us to think about in our own Christian lives. You don't earn His favor, earn His grace through some degree of repentance that you're striving toward or hoping to attain to. Maybe I just don't feel bad enough. I wish I could feel worse. Maybe then I'd have security that God looks on me with favor, that God looks on me with grace. Our hope is not found 
in the sincerity or earnestness or degree or level of our repentance or of some decision that we make to follow the Lord, our hope is not in the degree to which we turn in Godward sorrow. Am I miserable enough to earn it? Our hope is found in the grace and mercy and compassion of God who loves his people in the Lord Jesus Christ, grieves over their misery, and delights to show them mercy. We have our hope in the one who delights to show his people mercy. So what should we do? We should repent of our sin and trust him alone. He delights to show his people mercy. He delights to show them favor, grace. He delights to love them, care for them. We can't put ourselves back under the condemnation of the law, thinking that it's some ritualistic service that we perform that earns us better standing or more right standing with God. We trust him. We turn to him, love, devotion. And he is the one who is rich in grace and abounding in mercy. We trust him that he'll be merciful to us the sinners. We turn from our sin and entrust ourselves to him. Well, the Lord has final words to the brazen harlot of Ezekiel 16. The Lord says this in verse 60. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, and nevertheless is loaded because there's a lot that came before the nevertheless. Right? We've heard some of that tonight. For all that she has done, nevertheless, God says, I will remember my covenant with you. He is a faithful bridegroom. I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed. As a part of that new covenant, God takes out our heart of stone. He gives us a heart of flesh. He puts a new spirit within us, causes us to walk in his statutes and judgments. He says, I don't do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. And he says, be confounded, be ashamed for your ways, O Israel. We'll be ashamed, right, when the Lord does that work in our heart. You'll remember your ways and be ashamed, he says. I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed. Never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord. That sounds like an actual atonement, doesn't it? He provides an atonement for the possibility that you might one day turn and come. No, it's an actual atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. All of grace, all provided in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Return from your sins. Set all your hope in him. All your hope in him. Be saved from the wrath of God. For those in the Lord Jesus Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. Always. For those in the Lord Jesus Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you that you are merciful and compassionate and gracious and loving, and kind and good in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's such a great goodness that you pour out on all people, Lord, but that your steadfast love, your covenant goodness to those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is staggering, Lord, considering our sinfulness, considering, Lord, how we have rebelled against you, how adulterous we've been as friends of this world. And we praise you, Lord, that you have chosen to set your love, us, love on us in Christ. Praise you. We praise you, Lord, that you have changed our hearts, changed our minds. You have seated us in heavenly places. You've given us the mind of Christ, partakers of the divine nature. and You have caused us, Lord, to see our sin for the grievous offense that it is and caused us to see the person and work of our Savior as the treasure that he is. Help us, Lord, to always keep our eyes on you in faith and protect us, Lord, from departing from the one we love. Protect us from wandering and 
departing the living God. Help us to hold fast to you in faith for your glory, for our eternal good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.